Vezetők, akik átírták a történelmet. Politikusok, akiknek korlátlan hatalmuk volt sok millió ember sorsa felett. Diktátorok, akik élet és halál urai voltak. Apák, akiknek örökségét ma a gyerekeik cipelik. Az On The Spot hatodik évad a róluk szól, diktátorok leszármazottairól. A történelmet sokan ismerik, de minket most az ő történetük érdekel. Szubjektív lesz, nem is lehet más. Lesz köztük, aki jobban gyűlöli az apját, mint az áldozatai. Mások minden áron védeni akarják a szüleiket, és olyannal is találkozunk, aki egyenesen megszökött az apja rendszeréből. A helyszínek között van Uganda, Kambodzsa, Kuba, Chile és Németország is. Öt kontinensre utazunk el most is táv nélkül két kis kamerával, hogy minél közelebbről megismerjük őket. De azt nem tudjuk, hogy vajon képesek leszünk-e az apjuktól függetlenül látni őket, a diktátorok gyermekeit. már évtizedek óta katonai diktatúra volt, és a hunta tábornokai olyannyira elbízták magukat, hogy 1990-ben választásokat írtak ki. Egy Oxfordban tanult törékeny hölgy vezetésével legnagyobb meglepetésükre az ellenzék nyert. Nehezen kiejthető nevét az egész világ megtanulta, ugyanis a burmai tábornokok semmibe vették a választások eredményét, és letartóztatták Aung San Suu Kyi-t. Kisebb megszakításokkal közel 20 évet töltött házi őrizetben. Amikor néhány éve burmában forgattunk, még nem volt szabad hangosan kimondani a nevét. A föld alatti ellenzék csak úgy emlegette, a hölgy. Amíg fogva tartották, megkapta a béke Nobel-díjat. A világ legbefolyásosabb politikusai és művészei kampányoltak érte. És ez a filigrán asszony szépen lassan a demokrácia 20. századi ikonjává vált a négy fal között. Közben Angliában felnőttek a gyerekei. A férje gyógyíthatatlan beteg lett, de ő mindvégig burmában maradt. Mert bár a tábornokok felajánlották, hogy szabadon távozhat a férje halálos ágyához, ő attól félt, hogy soha többé nem engedik vissza Burmába, ahol szerinte a legnagyobb szükség volt rá. A gazdasági szankciók és a nemzetközi nyomás miatt a burmai diktatúra végül fokozatosan puhulni kezdett, és Aung San Suu Kyi-t szabadon engedték. Nála jobban kevesen ismerhetik a diktatúra természetét. Before I was arrested, I went around the country campaigning for our party, and I came into contact with ordinary people all over the place. And I knew that in any country, if the majority are determined to follow a certain path, they will be able to do it sooner or later. Of course, there was a lot of fear. If you've lived under dictatorship for many decades, then you get used to a state of fear. And getting over fear is not easy. But once they manage that first step, then I think they, ma they can go on. The nature of dictatorship or the nature of oppression, that in your opinion, like how, how does it work that a whole nation becomes submissive? to a dictator or to an oppressive regime and they and they just live with it they don't fight it for a long time how is this this national psyche working in I've your always opinion? found it very strange because my nature says that I always question everything and I think basically one of the great problems in my country was that people stopped asking questions. When they were told to do something by somebody who seemed to be an authority, they would do it without asking why. Whereas I always wanted to know the question why. Why should I do it? For what purpose? And what right had they to ask me to do it? And these were the questions that I would ask almost um, naturally and automatically. After we founded the National League for Democracy, this was one of the things we had to try to teach the members of our party that they must ask questions. They must not take everything for granted and they must not obey somebody who is an authority simply because he or she is an authority. Does he or she have the right to give these orders? That is the first thing. And then are these orders correct? Are they justified? And so on and so on. And the lack of these questions, is it because of fear? What is the role of fear in in keeping in place a dictatorship? It's partly culture and it's partly fear because I think uh, it is part of 
Burmese culture not to question your elders, mm -hmm. those who are in authority. I think uh, this is what our children are taught from a young age. On one hand, I, I like politeness. I like the fact that younger people are polite to older people because as people get older, they grow weaker. And, uh, and as younger people grow older, they grow stronger. And I, I always think that there is something particularly beautiful about the strong being tender with the weak and not taking advantage of the position. So it should work the other way around as well. But I'm afraid this goes on still quite a lot, not just in Burma, but I think in many other societies as well, that the strong, whether strong in years, or physically stronger, financially um, stronger, politically stronger, socially stronger, they do tend to want to dominate those who are weak. And, and what makes a nation accept that, other than culture? Fear, fear, of course, is fundamental to many things that go wrong in our world. I've said very often that fear is the foundation of hatred. When people say they hate somebody, basically they fear that person. You, there is no need for you to hate somebody that you don't fear. You may dislike him or her, well, that's perfectly all right. Uh, for example, we may Uh, we may dislike uh, sour fruits, but you won't say, people don't say, I I'm frightened of oranges. You know, you may just say, I don't like oranges. But people would say things like, I'm frightened, I'm, I hate snakes, which usually means they're frightened of snakes, or I hate insects, which usually means they're frightened of insects. So I, I think hatred and fear are very, very closely linked. And if we want to eliminate fear, We have to try to get at the roots of hatred. You mentioned that actually we can learn from our fears, but only if we face them. So we, yes. every fear has to teach something to us. And when did you learn this in your life? Well, very that early this is on, the way? <laughs> because I used to be afraid of the dark. When I was a child, I was terribly frightened of the dark. I thought there were ghosts lurking in the in dark. And whenever I went into a room where there were no lights on, I would insist that somebody should go in front of me and put the lights on because um, I found it very frightening going into a dark place. Then um, I suppose when I was about 11, I decided that this was getting ridiculous. And uh, to be frightened is a big burden. So I thought, well, I've got to face it. And, uh, and it was, once you decide to face it, you get over it very quickly. It only took me about two weeks. Every night I would go downstairs when the house was completely dark and walk around in the rooms. Well, the first few days were terrible. I was terrified. But well, after a week or so, that was it. And I was never frightened of the dark again. What was your fear or your biggest fear during your house arrest that you had to face in order to get rid of it? Well, I can't think of any big fear I had then. I was very much able to live on my own. I found that out very quickly, just within a matter of days, because it kept me totally alone. And about after a week or so, I knew that living alone was not going to be a problem for me. Besides, of course, I did have books. I was able to listen to the radio, so it was not as though I were um, totally, totally on my own with nothing except my inner resources. I, I did learn later that many people are unable to live on their own. I don't know whether this is something temperamental or this is something to do uh, with the way in which you are brought up. I was not really brought up alone. I was brought up in a very Burmese way, which means a lot that of always people around around lots you. of people yeah. around. You said that it was never a question for me to leave and abandon my friends and my people. And we were wondering that you could actually say the same regarding your own family. Yes, because uh, my family were much better off than my people. In the end, you choose the weaker ones, and you choose the ones with you, whom you have suffered together. My family are fortunate, they're well off, they are, they are materially well off, they live in a safe country where their rights were fully protected by the law. So in a sense, they were not the weaker of those with whom I was associated. I think in the end, you choose the ones who are weak and alone, because you feel that they need you more. Mm. Even if 
They're your children. And the children my, my children, usually, right? my children were far better off than the children of my colleagues in Burma because although I was under detention, my children were free and nobody was going to threaten their freedom in any way. In fact, they received a lot of compassion and sympathy and they were surrounded by caring friends and relatives. But um, the families of my colleagues who were imprisoned, now they had real problems to face especially if uh, the imprisoned parent happened to be the breadwinner. So suddenly they were left without an income. Their, their financial security was taken away from them. Their emotional security was taken away from them. And they were f perpetually under, under, under threat. They never knew when the authorities would start persecuting them not just the parent that they had not been arrested. Were your sons able to forgive this situation? Or did you ever ask for forgiveness because you were not there, because you were not no, there? No, I've never asked them for forgiveness. And I don't think it's for us to forgive one another. Mm. I think it's for us to try to make the best of our relationship as it is. Well, uh, we say in, Buddhist, uh, in Buddhism that it's unwholesome to indulge in remorse. Throughout your life, you have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. You have to make choices. And once you've made them, you live with them and make the best of them. And indulging in remorse doesn't get you anywhere. I don't really see the point of what ifs. I always think of the present and the future. And the past is for you to take lessons from, to draw lessons from. I don't think you should forget the past because uh, that means that uh, in a way you are abandoning the experiences that should help you to face the future in a better way. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, the past is the past. You know how uh, the Greeks used to say that even the gods can't change the past. And we say the same, a similar thing in um, Burmese Buddhism as well, that the Lord Buddha himself cannot undo what has already been done. Mm -hmm. so what has happened has already happened. You can't wish that it had not happened. Mm -hmm. But you can uh, have a lot of influence on how the results of whatever was done in the past should be shaped to make a better future. Tengo hoy aquí en el estudio a Lina Fernández Revuelta. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Siempre es muy interesante eh, leer la historia de Alina Fernández Revuelta, la hija. ¿Cómo te decían? No, no, Rebelde de Fidel yo, Castro. Yo lloré con eso. Yo ¿Sí? lloré con eso, sí, porque las editoriales te imponen los títulos de los libros, que son cosas que mucha gente desconoce, ¿no? Que las editoriales te obligan prácticamente, ¿no? no... O sea, que ese no era el título que tú querías darle a tu libro. Claro que no. Un adjetivo que ya era yo cargo como una losa. <risa> la forma en que entraste a este país me llamó muchísimo la atención. Eh, saliste a través de España, disfrazada. ¿Cómo fue eso? Bueno, ¿Disfrazada de qué? De turista española. ¿Verdad? Y olé, claro. Porque me prestaron un pasaporte de una muchacha española que se sacó, se falsificó en otro lado. Bueno, es algo así bastante rocambolesco, ¿no? 
pero tuve que salir con ese pasaporte que ya tenía mi foto, el nombre de ella, no voy a decir el apellido, era Victoria, y estuve practicando la noche anterior cómo firmar como ella y algunas cositas así, ¿no? <risa> Hazle cuento el taxista, Lina, please. Entonces, bueno, para buscar el taxi, mi hija fue la que salió a buscar el taxi, yo me vestí, y me maquillé y me disfracé, que eso es posible, disfrazarse de turista español en Cuba, en el edificio, un edificio que quedaba cerca del Mella, al fondo del Mella. Entonces, cuando salí de ese edificio ya transformada, mi hija había ido a buscar el taxi. Yo me fui hablando como española hasta el aeropuerto José Martí. ¡Qué guapa eres! Bueno, ¿no sentías miedo? Soy un poco payasa también. Sabes que lo de ser clown va, corre en la sangre. Y entonces... <risa> <risa> Señora, buen entendedor con pocas palabras basta. Lo, lo disfruté de cierta manera, pero fue también el momento más desgarrador de mi vida, fíjate. Sí, claro. Y lograste eh, violar la aduana e inmigración. En una época en que no había computadora, no, hace más de 20 uh -huh. años, imagínate tú, eso tú sabes. Ellos tienen unas cámaras fotográficas en la vista, pero yo iba bastante bien disfrazadita, llevaba una gorrita puesta, eh, un sobre todo. Pero bueno, fue relativamente fácil, la verdad, comparado con otra gente que, que hasta, bueno, no, no solo se ha arriesgado la vida sino que la ha perdido tratando de salir de Cuba. Óyeme, Alina, eh, cuéntame algo. Estuviste casada con uno de los bailarines principales del ballet nacional de Cuba, ¿no? Entre otros. Ah, sí, fueron no, muchos matrimonios. Entre otros matrimonios, no, otros bailarines, sí. <risa> eh, ¿Cómo se siente uno cuando a uno le dicen, tú eres la hija de Fidel? Por cierto, volviendo al ballet, <risa> es el papá de mi niña, el bailarín. Bueno, ¿cómo se siente uno? Eh, es un, eso fue un cambio de identidad para mí, porque mientras estaba en Cuba trataba de negarlo. Y desde que salí de Cuba, pues lo asumí. Pensé que asumiendo lo iba a ser un poquito más útil. Bueno, pero en Cuba la gente sabía que tú existías. Sí, pero en Porque Cuba. Porque cuando las cosas tú son eras locales. modelo de la mesón, yo me recuerdo ah, sí. que yo iba muchísimo a la mesón y todo el mundo decía, Alina la modelo, la que es hija de Fidel. Amigo. ¿Tú te consideraste en toda esa etapa que tú viviste en Cuba, aunque estuvieras al margen de que la población supiera que tú eras la hija del comandante, ¿te consideraste en algún momento una niña privilegiada? No, o sí. Mm. Mira, yo es que el, un privilegio en Cuba es una cosa tan sencilla como, como tener una casa, ¿ves? Entonces, sí, nosotros teníamos una casa, mi mamá tenía un carro que, por cierto, fue envejeciendo junto con la revolución porque era un carro de 59 que acabó... BW. No, era un Mercedes. Ah, ya. Que acabó siendo sí. encendido con un alambrito y apagado con otro. <risa> Sabemos, no sé, ustedes se fueron hace mucho tiempo, yo hace 60 días estaba allá. Eh, el país está destrozado, los hospitales están destrozados, todo está destrozado. Escuelas al campo aquellas, se las están repartiendo los campesinos como viviendas, ¿no? Pero entonces son pequeños este, ciudadelas, como se dice en México, unos se convertirán en solares. Se, se convertirán en solares. Y él me decía, y lo he notado aquí, Cuba vive en, en, en Miami, Cuba vive en el, en, en el exilio histórico. ¿Qué te gustaría escuchar? Lo dejo a la elección tuya, fíjate no, que confío tuya, totalmente muy invitada. en ti. Estamos celebrando el Día de las Madres, eh, lo que tú quieras escuchar. Pueblo mío, que estás en el Caribe. Como un viejo que se muere La pena, el abandono Son tu triste compañía Pueblo mío Me fui sin alegría ¿Qué será? ¿Qué será? Es la vida sabiendo. 
I always had the feeling that nothing was normal around me because people will approach you asking you for things. It doesn't matter what. I mean, it could be a house or a pair of shoes, which I didn't have, by the way. So the only way you have to protect yourself from that is to say, my name is Fernandez. I'm not related to him. My mother gave everything up and she somehow also became a leper because nobody will approach her. I mean, no man will go and ask her to go to a party or to have dinner with because they were afraid. They always said, well, it's, a, it's like a sacred cow. You know, she, she already belonged to a commandante, so I won't even, and she has a daughter with a commandante. What, what will I do her? Will I help her raise the commandante daughter? Everybody was scared to death. Being Castro's daughter in Cuba is going to bring over you every possible reaction, depending on if they like him or not, uh, or they love him, crazy love, or they hate him, crazy hate, or whatever. That's what you're going to have. You're never going to be yourself, and it took me many, many years to, to try to you know, to go, at least convince myself that I was this human being who liked this or that or disliked this or that. I tried to, to live a normal life beside that relationship. And I understood from the beginning that people were not reacting, I mean, basically to me, uh, but to him. También hay un asunto. Él fue un dictador y sacó adelante este país y lo entregó a la democracia bien. Eso, eh, digamos, sería como mal ejemplo para el mundo, porque ellos siempre dicen que los dictadores tienen que ser malos y tienen que ser asesinos, tienen que ser ladrones, tienen que ser eh, crueles. Entonces, que aparezca un hombre humano, eso no les conviene. Ahora, yo creo que muchos abusos de los derechos humanos no, no estaban en conocimiento, es lo que yo creo. 
porque él se dedicaba solamente a trabajar ahí en el escritorio y delegó. Además que él yo creo que nunca pensó que su familia la iban a perseguir como nos han perseguido a nosotros. Sí. Porque no teníamos nada que ver, no tuvimos cargo, nada. Y, y nos han perseguido tremendamente. O sea, es como una venganza por lo que no le pudieron hacer a él, nos quieren hacer a nosotros. O sea, Terriblemente doloroso. Porque él, ahí tiene la ingenuidad. Él pensó que él era el militar, que él era el que estaba dando la cara, pero que no teníamos nada que ver nosotros. Incluso nunca nos dio nada de, de cargo. Nunca, una vez le pidieron que por qué yo no me, present, no me, no me nombraba alcaldesa y él no quiso. Yo no lo veo como un dictador. Yo, no lo, yo lo veo, mira, yo lo veo como un soldado que sintió la obligación de sacar adelante a este país y que tuvo que, que acudir a la fuerza porque era la única forma de, de cambiar la situación. Militar no está para líder político, no. Y el político es como una enfermedad de la sociedad hoy día, porque por, por conveniencia mienten, pelean, intrigan. Did he ever tell sorry for those people who were? Yes, yes, yes. Sí. Cuando estaba enfermo y todo, él escribió una carta. What was in that letter? What What was in that letter? Uh, una carta pidiendo perdón. Él, es que él eh, pide perdón a la gente que le causó dolor. Eh, eh, y explica que lo que significó para él tomar el poder y, y todo. Bueno, él explica que el país estaba muy mal y que él eh, se sintió con la obligación moral de, de tomar el poder para sacar adelante el país. Que él realmente lo hizo, o sea, pensando en lo mejor para el país, sin egoísmo ni ambiciones, y que en realidad sí quedaron muchas personas en el camino que sufrieron o fueron víctimas de esto. Él les pedía perdón y decía que, que realmente lo sentía mucho, pero él pensó que lo que hacía era lo mejor para el país. Y así fue. No lo consideraron. No. Por eso me da mucha pena, pues. Que era muy tarde ya para hacerlo. Linda, preciosa. Hola. Hola. Gracias. When I was uh, younger and I was uh, in the leftist movement and um, it was about being a leader of this and I said, okay, small group I can do, big, no way. Like really being afraid of the abuse of power. So there was, I don't know if you call it self-hate, but definitely a fear of if I would go into these footsteps, it'd be that disastrous. That's like Herman and, and, and these people going, They literally went over their bodies. I mean, they, they went as far as killed their own co-conspirators, like, uh, like the Royal Porches. So, 
total example of it. You know? yeah. Hitler came to power, the first thing he, he killed his rivals, you know? the ones who were with him. And, and, and he was one of the few people, out of five people maybe, who, who had a very, very intimate relationship to, 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 to Hitler. And he was personally present when, when he got arrested. He went there and, and was there when he got arrested. And then he went away and later gave the command to kill him. So what does that make you if you can do that? Somebody who, who was a friend, who, somebody who supported you, somebody you were very close to, do that. And, just for, for, for power, you just let him die. Yeah. And you, I mean, let him die, you have him killed. That's a psychopath. You know? that's, that's what the definition of a psychopath is. And Goering wasn't any different. I mean, he said, I, I, I declare, I say who is a Jew, was one of his famous things. But then at the Wannsee conference, he signed the final solution. I mean, he signed it. You know? His name was under it as the highest authority. So he gave the order to, to eliminate the final solution, eliminate all the Jews, kill them all. And um, he, wasn't, he wasn't very picky about people who were useful to him, he supported, and even by, whether they were Jews or not, he wasn't really anti-Semitic, I would say. He really was a total opp opportunist and was totally into power. And he, would, and he literally sold his soul I don't think your genes is your destiny. On the other hand, to completely deny them, see, I'm coming from the other extreme. I was there, and it, it, it was a learning experience in my life to see that the genes do matter as well. And, and there is this thing, I mean, the Native Americans, every country, every religion, every, every culture has this thing of honoring your ancestors. And, and to, to completely judge them and say they are awful and you want nothing to do with them. It's a, it's a problem here, too. That's what I'm trying to work with. I'm trying to heal something there in me, and it doesn't change anything of what they've done at the same time. So it's like as if you say half of your ancestry, half of your genes are bad. That's not so cool. Doing, uh, in my case, the sterilization, that, that is a way of cutting it off. That is rather extreme, huh? How old were you? 30, 31. And it wasn't just for that. At the time, I wasn't so consciously that I did it because of that. It was more like, oh, I've never wanted children. If I don't want to have them now, I think I, I'll do that. It was like that, you know? I mean, you're cutting part of yourself, big part. Mm -hmm. The reproductive part, you're cutting the genes. You are. To go on. It took a long time to even realize that having that judgment of my family has had a lot to do with it. I think it did, also. You know, not alone, but also. And when we got together, uh, which was after I had my tubes tied, uh, my body didn't like it very much after I did that. And I started to go to acupuncture. And after a year, and around the same time we met, I got pregnant, in spite of it. And so, uh, and then I had a miscarriage, and I wanted the child. It was like the first time, oh wow, I actually do. <laughs> and then uh, I think it healed itself. And things happen, wild things happen, huh? Then I th and he didn't want the chi a child. And then I thought, well, if this is meant to be, it'll happen. And it didn't. Again. I mean, it was a one time. I can look at it uh, hormonally, but I was so happy being pregnant. I understood why women get addicted to being pregnant. I thought, I had no idea because of the tubes tying. and. Uh, I thought I'd gotten enlightened or something. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> I don't know, 
it's an art piece. It's a couple and on top of it is like Auschwitz or Dachau or something. Can you imagine, you look at that every day in your apartment, how awful. It's 86 and uh, 78 they are. Wow. Tja. I can only imagine. They have to start fresh now. It's one thing to be a victim and get your attention from that and then just to be yourself again. And a lot of them do, do that, of course, they, they get on with their lives and, and they just push it away. That's most, most people did, I think, and not talk about it. It's probably the fewest who do this. What an outlook on life. But it's a choice. So hard. Who are we to say, you know, how to how to deal with this dilemma? It's horrendous, and they probably lost their whole family, and it's awful. I mean, all all one can do is say, look, this is now. This is me. I wish you well. I'm sorry. Forgive my ancestors. Please forgive them, and thank you for listening. I cannot do more than that. I can't undo it, what happened. I think a lot of souls got stuck in some limbo of the Holocaust and of the war. I mean, so many people died a violent death. You know, all the soldiers, all the Holocaust victims, and a lot of them are still around because maybe we cannot let them go unconsciously or consciously, and that is with grief, as in from Israel to the Holocaust victims, or maybe with grief for our own ancestors, with judgment, what I was doing, of their actions, um, with uh, denial, with guilt, any of those emotions. And I think that's why it's so important to try and heal it to let go of these people. And I think we will be clear to start something else, much more clean. What is evil? Is it made, you know? I think it's too easy to just say somebody is evil and somebody is a psychopath. I think we all have it in us, in the right circumstances. Who knows what we will do? Honestly, you you are your father's son. That's the only way I can say it. Yeah. And everybody will always come and compare you at that. You're never called Jafar. They always say son of oh, Idi Amin. Idi Amin. Yeah. That's true. And you're judged for any negativity or positivity you do. It's based on, look what the son of Amin has done. Oh, what a wonderful the son of Amin has done. I've had so much of that. Mm. But I tell them, you know what? I've had all my life to go through that. And enough's enough. I've gone through it. I've, I've learned to move on. Learned to be just who I am. It won't help me. It won't take me anywhere. But it will make me a much better person. How can I come out of the shadow of my father? I love him as a parent. I cherish his love for me. I am sorry that power corrupted us. You could want whatever you wanted. 
You could get whatever you want. You can fly whatever you want. What would life have been if this if. hadn't happened? If this, what would it have been? Where would I be right now? What would it have been? Listen, Jenny, you, you know, you put all the equations together and say, ah, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Who am I to say that, oh, I would have, let me go back. I wish I could go back in time and change and become first son. Why? Huh? Now, let's say, let's say they were talking about all of this and then it had happened. Let's say my dad did become president or what, something happened, a coup or whatever, right? Where would I be now? I'd be probably be a spoiled brat somewhere, probably even dead. I don't think I would have gone and struggled in the States, then met Bess and had my children. Pam and all, how? Yeah, I think we could change totally around 180 degrees for us from have it all to almost nothing. He wasn't in his suit that he usually used to wear. Uh, it was just a shirt, but it was caked in blood. The arms were crossed over his chest, so, and they were broken, and the face was, showed um, trauma, a lot of beating and scratches. There were 33 bullet holes, three knife marks around the neck, Broken bones. I'm not sure which one. I can't remember the years have gone. My memory slips me. And one of the bones was actually and actually torn through the flesh, so it was sticking up. And the leg, one of the legs, also was broken up completely. The bone was also sticking up. That's the condition that I was told. They waited for three days because they said, "Look, let's wait for the children to come back." The body started to decompose. Understandably so, when you have open wounds like that. So they decided that, you know what, we better bury him. So my mom said, yeah, let's go ahead and bury him. Uh, we arrived one and a half months later is when we came. I'd broken my arm, I remember, on the motorcycle scrap, scrambling in Nairobi at the time. Uh, a month later, one and a half months later is when we we arrived. Ah. Yeah, that was, that was mm. Why would Uncle I mean do this? Why? I mean who came home would run around. Lift me up, joke around with that, call me jet fighter, and all of that. I just couldn't understand it when I was a kid. It took me a lot of years. <sighs> I don't know at an uh, individual level mm -hmm. how much of a uh, regret or sorry. I don't know how to say it. How do you say sorry? At yeah. the tragic end of this. Yeah. Jaffa, you know one thing? Yeah, I can't right, even right, right, say right, right, sorry right. on behalf of my father. I know. I know. But as an individual, a human being says sorry for what you have just said. I don't think anybody has had this. I have, I have never had the pain that I'm hearing. I see the burden of the cross you're carrying. And let me tell you one thing. Frankly, I feel sorry for you because you are really a genuine, decent and honest person and a true friend of mine. But what you're going through, I wouldn't want it in a thousand years. What happened, happened. We can't change the past. No way. We can only learn from it and move forward. You can't carry a grudge. 
or say, oh yeah, this and that. No. Let God be the judgment, the judge of all that. You have Ugandans or you have in society people say like that saying, was it Gandhi? That an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. Well, yeah. Now, what's the point? If you're all blind, who's going to lead the other to the watering hole? He sensed it that something was going to happen. His last trip to the farm, he called all his cousins. He got up and said, follow me. So they followed him, joking and laughing and so on. And he walked behind the church that he had built. And he picked up a stick and he stuck it in the ground. And he said, when I die, bury me here. My father was a soldier, and he ruled like a soldier. And he was attacked because of being a soldier in a position of power. A lot happened. But there's one thing I know, and one thing I've always known, that this family has always been the family that were true friends to my father. The one who taught him possibilities that were there, the one who showed him ways which he could rule better with. He relied a hundred percent on the both of Fumbi family. When we were in exile, he used to lament. It is almost like when two friends go apart, or a marriage is, somebody goes through divorce. You remember the love, you remember the happiness, you remember the joy. You remember the sorrow. I was innocent as a child, but I will keep going and asking us to be one. May you accept my apology on behalf of my people, on behalf of my father, on behalf of the issues of power. The acceptance is a humbling experience for me. And I thank my mother. Thank you. We thank you very much for your coming. But sir, in our culture we have some thing to be done and we clear off any problems completely. We need you to bring here a bull mm -hmm. for slaughtering, mm -hmm. one half of a cow mm -hmm. for keeping the at the home, mm -hmm. one male sheep, mm -hmm. a he goat, three cocks. Mm -hmm. You are the one to bring these things, mm -hmm. nations above. Mm -hmm. And whenever you come, feel at home, we are ready to receive you. God is after giving for God and, and our family. <laughs> and the country. <laughs> Not the country, Thank our you, family. Jose. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is exactly how Kakwas do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I give this sheep as the atonement. This one is the symbol of uh, cleansing. May the two families come together and stay together and work together and help together and have the same love that they used to have in the past. On this day, this one will prove to us that we are one again, me and Godfrey, both of Fumbi. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Something to see. Giddy, 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 gidd